Welcome from Fort Worth, Texas. My name is Al Meredith. I'm Pastor Emeritus here at Wedgwood Baptist Church on the southwest side of town, serving under lead pastor Dale Braswell. We have begun a study in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation on the seven churches of the book of Revelation and what we can learn from God's letter to them through the Apostle John. Let me have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, quiet my heart. Teach this class through me. Lord, may your grace permeate the calluses of our hearts. Start with me. Rekindle the flame that once burned. Holy Spirit, I'm depending upon you to think your thoughts through my mind, speak your words through my mouth, live your life through my body, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In our family's history, there was a period of time when we were always strapped for money. Becky was in college, Josh had his expenses, and here at Wedgwood, we were going to have through building program after building program, which calls, first of all, for sacrificial pledges from the staff, and me being lead pastor, I led the way. So, we were broke. So, our cars were, in a word, jalopies, used cars, nothing more than $1,500, and we would always name them because of the characteristics. So let me introduce you to Ruby. Ruby was a fire engine red Nissan 200SX. I was going, I suppose, through a midlife crisis as I think about it now. Five speed on the floor, solid chrome wheels, and that sucker could fly. I bought it off a lot on the cart where you can really get cheap, slightly damaged cars. Well, I began to notice what mechanics call blow-by when I idled. Clouds of black smoke out your tailpipe. It meant it was burning oil. It meant it was leaking oil around the piston rings into the firing chamber. That was bad enough. And then a knock, what they call, from deep with inside the engine. So I took it to my favorite uh, mechanic who is needed only more by my favorite doctor. Anyhow... He removed the valve cover, and this is what he said. Uh-oh. You don't want to hear that from your mechanic or your doctor, by the way. And I said, what is it, Tony? And he said, sludge. Sludge is back gooey, black gooey, putty-like gook everywhere. The previous owner or owners had neglected poor Ruby. They never changed the oil. And so the bad oil just began to semi-solidify and block things up. Folks, when cars are neglected like that, nothing can reverse the curse. And we finally had to get rid of Ruby. Churches can be like that. Pretty on the outside, damaged on the inside by abuse or neglect. Going through the motions of ministry, busy schedules, and no passion. I'm told that 85% of American churches, evangelical churches, are either plateaued or declining. 85%. Once passionate, once on fire, now paralyzed by sludge and neglect. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we have God's message to seven, frankly, sludgy churches. In Asia Minor. Today I want to talk about the first one. It is the church at Ephesus. Now I need to realize in Paul's day, Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the whole Roman Empire, thriving metropolis, the largest city in all of Asia Minor. Ephesus was a wealthy city, a commercial center. At Ephesus was the Temple of Diana, one of the eight wonders of the ancient world. So tourists and religious pilgrims would come to Ephesus. Paul founded the church at Ephesus. He spent three years there, more than he spent in any other church that he ever dealt with. Three years building up the body of Christ in Ephesus and in the towns around it. Ephesus was the evangelical capital of Asia Minor. Several years ago, Kay and I went on a trip to Jerusalem. On the way back, we stopped off at Athens and took a three-day side trip through the Aegean Sea, and one of the places we stopped at Ephesus. And my heart was broken as I looked around. Ephesus today is dead, 
lifeless, empty of everything but curious tourists like Kay and me, archaeological ruins, and the only people who live there today are Muslims, who are basically tour guides for the ruins that are all that's left of the city of Ephesus. What could have turned this thriving, bustling church and paralyzed it and destroyed it? Well, let me read the text. Revelation 2, the first seven verses. God is speaking here and he says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. By the way, angel here means messenger. or Basically, he's addressing the pastor of the church. Verse 2. No, verse 1 still. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. In each letter, he identifies and describes what Christ is to that church. Verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And I know that you have pre persevered, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Great. Report card. Straight A's. Not quite. Verse 5, verse 4, nevertheless, God says, I have this against you, uh-oh, and here's what God has against the church at Ephesus, you have left your first love. Here's the cure, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, it's interesting, the Bible and God knows psychology. And if you've ever, ever got to deliver a bad report or an evil report or criticism of someone, it is always best to sandwich the criticism with praise. And so God does that. He begins, first of all, with a commendation. And God says, I know all about you, as he knows all about your church and your life. He said, to begin with, you are a serving church. God says, I know your works. That word works is the word energase from which we get energy. They were busy, they were active, there were many ministries, there were programs, they had a packed calendar. The biggest debate was when the staff met and tried to counter things that didn't overlap with each other. I know churches like that. Did you know that you can serve God faithfully and still forfeit his favor? Good works can be for the wrong reasons. And leave all leave our completely leave us rather completely corrupt. There's a sign on a building in Poland urging people to, and here it quote, obedience, diligence, honesty, order, cleanliness, temperance, truthfulness, sacrifice, and love of one's country. That's over the portals of the building. This building is the administration at building of Dachau, a Nazi concentration camp that murdered hundreds of thousands of Jews with diligence, obedience, orderliness, efficiency, and love of one's country. The elder brother in the story of the prodigal son did all the right things but had no real relationship with the father. Busyness works are no substitute for loving relationship. They were a serving church. Secondly, they were a sacrificing church. He said, not only I know your works, I know your labor. That word labor is an extreme word for toil to the point of exhaustion. It's intensive. This church sounds like a whole lot of Southern Baptist churches I know. You've heard the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. It would have grown to be a sheep but she joined a Southern Baptist church and died for lack of sleep. We can burn our people out with good things, good ministries, 
but it's no substitute for a loving relationship with God. You can wear yourself out with ministry and still be, what we say down here, lost as a goose. Back in 1733, there was a group of men at Oxford University who called themselves the Holy Club, and they were sincere. They included both Charles and John Wesley, the founders of Methodism, George Whitfield, who preached the Great Awakening here in America and in England. Whitfield writes in his biography, he said, and I quote, Never did person strive more earnestly to enter in at the straight gate. He said they lived by the rule. They rose up early. They had their devotions. They kept a religious journal. They judged themselves by any wasted moments in their day. And they held each other accountable. They fasted twice a week. They attended church regularly, not just on Sunday mornings, all week long. They visited the prisons every week. They supported prisoners' children. Yet they were lost. They had no living relationship with Christ. Only years later, when they came to the end of themselves, did they cast themselves on God's mercy and grace. Up at four o'clock in the morning for three hours of personal and corporate devotions and lost as can be. I can remember pastoring my first church in Georgia. And one spring afternoon, the wife of one of my young deacons came running into my office, just sobbing, oh, Brother Al, Brother Al. And she couldn't even get the words out. And I finally told her, take deep breaths. She was so distraught. She had just been asked to be the director of Vacation Bible School. It's coming up in June. And she realized, Brother Al, I'm lost. I need to be born again. Just sobbing, sobbing. She worked in the nursery faithfully. She was a Sunday school teacher, a deacon's wife, a young mother, devoted to the church. I'm sure they tithed, and she was lost. And I had the privilege of leading her to faith in Christ. Her last name was even Christian, but lost. Well, they were a serving church, a sacrificing church. They were a steadfast church. God says, I know your patience, your perseverance. Ephesus was not just a flash in the pan, two-week revival, and then things blew over. They were in it for the long run. You can be faithful to God's church all your life and still forfeit God's favor. And finally, they were a separated church. They tested false prophets who claimed to be apostles. They were spiritually mature. They were steeped in the Word of God. Paul had, had discipled them well. It says in verse 6, that they hated the Nicolaitans. That's an interesting word. The word Nike, which you know is the winged goddess of victory, and Laetans has to do with the laity, the congregation. There were people in the church in the first century that literally bullied the common people. Well, I've got a THD, and I'm telling you, this is what we need to do. In 1 Peter 5, it's right here, I'm going to turn back. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3, Peter gives... Uh, uh, counsel and commandments and direction to the elders, the pastors. Begin, they say, he says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, don't bilk the people of money, but eagerly, not as being lords or masters over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That's how pastors ought to lead. Not throwing their ecclesiastical weight around, well, I'm the pastor here, I'm the ordained one, and I say this. Not trying to bully people because you've got a theological education. And the Ephesians had noticed people like that and dismissed them from their fellowship. I know red-faced, angry bullies masquerading as pastors, browbeating their people week in and week out. And in Ephesus, they were not allowed to lead. These people were doctrinally sound. They could quote the Apostles' Creed, but they were out of favor with God. You can be doctrinally pure, active in the kingdom, and still God displeased with your life. Well, that's the commendation. Many, many wonderful things to be said about this church. But there is one but, one accusation, and it's found in verse 4. I have this against you, 
that you left your first love. All the good works in the world are meaningless if they are not motivated and fired by love of Christ. I don't know of a single person in my acquaintance as a pastor for 30, 40 years who could compare with the track record of the average Pharisee in Jesus' day. To be a Pharisee, you had to memorize not only the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you had to memorize the whole Old Testament and half of the commentaries on the Old Testament. They didn't just tithe. The average Pharisee gave up to 28% of his income to the synagogue. The Pharisees were radical scholars, pure as a driven so do, no, doctrinally, serious as a heart attack when it comes to obedience, but totally lost. The people at Ephesus had much good to be said, but they had left their first love. Did you know that Yahweh is a passionate lover? In Luke 1334. We have the Son of Man, the second person of the Trinity, making his final journey in Jerusalem. He stops on the mountain overlooking the valley of Kidron, and there is the skyline of Jerusalem with a temple and all. And he weeps and he cries, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you as a mother hen does her chicks, but you would not. Passionate lovers long for it. They demand passion in return. As I say, in this letter to the Ephesians church, he commends them for hard works, discernment, all this kind of thing. What more could God want? You've left your first love. There's no passion. You're doing it out of inertia. As a husband, I can provide for my wife. I can be faithful to her. I can protect her. I can even carry out the garbage without being asked. But guys, if my eyes don't light up when I see her after we've been separated for a time, if I never caress her cheek, if I never hold her tight, she will never be content with our relationship. There'll be a stone in her heart that she'd gladly carry out the garbage herself if I would just show her some passion. We've been, Kay and I have been married together, thank God, 53 years, grace of God. Still, little ways of showing our love that our passion hasn't died. These last two weekends, we've been away. First, I was away for a weekend. She's away for the women's retreat, to a retreat down in Granbury. Wonderful, wonderful time with godly people. Time of refreshing and revival. But when they came in for the final ceremonies and she looked at the crowd to gather, there was one face she was looking for, one face she wanted to see, one pair of eyes that were gleaming with, I see you, dearest, and we'll be together soon. God wants us to love him like that. You know, the Pharisees were biblical scholars. They persevered. They were obedient, they were pure, but they had one thing against them. Most of us say, hey, dude, four out of five ain't bad. That's 80%. What are you complaining about? Not God. God prioritizes passion. Just read 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not love, I'm sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Though I have faith that can remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. There is no substitute for passionate love for God. And God can't be satisfied with anything less than that. It strikes me it might be a good thing for churches to take time out every now and then from their busy activities and just focus for a while on restoking the fires of passion. Nothing can be a substitute for time alone with God. 
time reflecting on his love and grace. Just saying. I don't want to attack every ministry. Well, they left their first love, genuine agape, and that's the word that the Bible, that God invented for godly love. Agape love is unconditional. It is indiscriminate, loving even the least. Love for God starts with that. Sometimes, you know, we measure discipleship by who's number one on your list of priorities. And here's a question. Does Jesus want to be number one in your life? We used to sing a song back when I was in college. Why don't you give him first place in your heart? And I came around, da 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 Give him first place in your heart. And I have a word for you today. God does not want first place. He does not want to be at the top of your list. He demands to be not number one, but the one and only. No rivals. Nobody pushing him from second place. He wants to be the only God in your path and your Parthenon of idols. What if I assured my wife Kay that she was the top lover on my list? But I need a couple days every month or so with Bertha. And one week out of a year with Hortense, would that be asking too much? Hey, honey, you're still number one in my book. And she'd say, don't you babe me. She insists on being my one and only, forsaking all others and giving myself to her. Keep us only till death does part. Wife, children, jobs, friends, they're important. Don't get me wrong. But only God deserves to be your all in all. Everything else pales in comparison. Whenever uh, there's a conflict, there's no discussion. Jesus trumps everything. <sighs> My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. Well, God's looking for genuine agape from us for Him. But he also desires it, our love for the brethren. In the final upper room, his last words, he says, this is the chief distinguishing characteristic of my followers is that they love one another. The golden rule says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's kind of me-centered. How do I want to be treated? Well, that's why I treat others. Here in John 15, God gives us the platinum rule. Love one another. Agape love. Greater love has no man in this that he lays down his life for his friend. It's other-centered. Little steps. When God asks for consecration, we think, okay, God, here's my life. I give it all to you. Well, he takes it up, not in $100,000 trust fund, but in quarters and dimes and nickels each day. Do you give your wife a hug when she's down? Do you encourage your children by your presence at their key events? Are you faithful in your church? Do you write notes of encouragement for discouraged people? Just little steps. Take out the garbage. Don't get upset when you get to church and someone's in your seat. Oh, please. Don't insist on your preference in music. Lay down your life for others. Not only for God, not only for the brethren, but for the least of these. The least of these, unlovely beggars, the broken and the bruised. 
Because if you scratch a little bit just underneath the surface, almost all of us are broken. But Jesus goes unspeakably further than anyone else in history. He says, when you love your enemies. Someone has said, I really only love God as much as the person I love the least. Oh, am I convicted. Vladimir Putin, a thug, a killer, and someday will be held accountable. But I cannot hate Vladimir Putin. This clown in North Korea firing off intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles and standing by while his people starve, as evil as that is, and as much as we need to contend against that evil, I can't hate them. The abortion doctors, the crack dealer, the child abusers, we can't hate them. We hate their actions, sinful activities. But God says, if you follow me, you've got to love even your enemies. Oh. Well, what's the correction? You have the commendation, you have the objection, and finally, what's the correction? Two words. One, number one, remember. Remember what things were. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember those times when you were passionate for me, when there was no rival in your life. When couples would come to me for marriage counseling, one of the assignments I would give them is to sit down alone together one evening and make a list of all the things that first attracted you to them when first you met. What were the little things about her or him that lit your fire? And then share it with one another and recall, oh yes, I remember that. Yes, I remember it was Kay's perfume, white shoulders, that she dabbed her letters and notes to me with. And it was my Old Spice aftershave that I poured on my letters and cards to her. Those kind of things. Your first love letters. The songs that you shared. The Everly Brothers. And recall the passion that was once there and do what you can to rekindle it. Recall what it was like when first you came to faith in Christ. The second verse, I think it is of amazing grace. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." It's been 60-some years since I first became a Christian. It is good for me to go back to that Sunday night in April 1953, when as a six and a half year old child, struggling with guilt and sin and crying myself to sleep for three months, and going to Ebenezer Baptist Church on Maross Road in Detroit, Michigan, and walking that aisle and going with the evangelist with three or four others and him sharing Acts 16:31, how I could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I would be saved. And the joy that flooded my soul that night that's one of the ways to rekindle the passion. Remember, and the second word is repent. Where have you allowed other things, sometimes even good things, sometimes even church things, to cloud your passionate relationship with Christ? Repent. Change your mind. That's what repent means. Change your mind, heart, and actions. Turn around like a U word. I'm going down this way, but it's taken away from, my, from passion with Christ. Repent and turn around and get back on that passionate love relationship with Christ. One verse one, we, Jesus describes himself as the Christ who holds the seven stars, who walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks. The candlesticks are the churches. And Jesus is right there. And the point is he cares for his church. Cares enough to die for them cares enough to call them back to a love relationship. Do you love your church? I know, I know, dear child of God, there are some really abusive churches out there. 
led by religious folks who don't know the Lord. You have trouble with religious folks. Jesus had trouble with religious folks. They're the ones that had him crucified. But Jesus loves his church. German theologian of the 19th century Schopenhauer said once, I quote, I could take Jesus Christ a lot easier if I didn't have to also put up with his leprous bride, the church. Well, guess what? Jesus says, love me, love my church. If someone came up to me and said, Brother Al, I think you're the best pastor I've ever had. I love the way you preach. He's kind. You're so approachable. But I've met your wife, and she's a pain in the neck. I really would do without her. You'd better duck. Because when it comes to me and Kay, love me, love my bride. And Jesus says the same thing. If you want to love me, love my bride, the church. And if your passion for Christ doesn't kindle your love and devotion to the local church, you don't either understand the relationship or it's a phony passion. Jesus says, love me, love my church. Kindle that fire, kindle that passion. Lord Jesus, forgive us for substituting anything but for a passion for you, for all that you've done for us. Eternity won't be long enough to thank you. Oh God, rekindle the flame in our hearts, I pray, that you be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless.